So I think that everyone present in this room can agree that Seventh-day Adventism is a growing problem. Over 22 million members worldwide as of last June, and some other statistics to give you some context. In 2021, there were just over a million accessions. I assume most of you know what that means. That, that means new members, converts. That does not include births. Over a million. That averages out to one accession every 30 seconds or so. One new congregation every 3.62 hours. And at the same time, and I'm sure this will also be of interest to you, in 2021, there were almost 800,000 losses, which equals people leaving. That does not include deaths. Over the past 15 years, the rate of net losses is about 42%. Is that something to celebrate? Or, in truth, are many of these people, perhaps even most, adventized and spiritually damaged and confused and in need of rescue themselves, even though they have walked away? Now, for me as a missionary, and, and Richard alluded to this, I take special note of the following numbers. In 2021, the top 20 countries in terms of Adventist membership make up, made up nearly 75% of the world total. Three quarters in just 20 countries. 11 of those top 20 countries are in Sub-Saharan Africa. And amazingly, those 11 countries, their membership makes up nearly 40% of the world total. So my real world challenge, my day-to-day -day challenge, is I help believers in Kenya and Uganda and Zambia and Malawi and so forth, is how can we best persuade Christians in Africa that Adventism is so biblically unsound that its false teachings need to be firmly rejected and its followers need to be evangelized? Because... Adventism has a rather high reputation in these countries where it is so well established and growing at such a clip. You see, I've learned in 40-some years of going to Eastern Southern Africa, lay African Christians don't do nuance well. They just want to know, is it true or is it false? Is it a cult or isn't it? and not a lot in between is satisfying to them. Now, we have a problem because Adventism is the duck platypus of Christianity. <laughs> it defies easy categorization. And Adventist attitudes toward us, what do you call it? Is it schizophrenia? Is it gaslighting? Uh, you know, one minute they want to sing Kumbaya with all the Protestants, and the next minute, they're the remnant church of Bible prophecy, and Sunday worship is the mark of the beast observed by Babylon and her harlot daughters. <laughs> Which is it to be? Depends, doesn't it? Which brings me to a dilemma that we face sometimes, not only in Africa, but here in the United States. How do we best label this growing problem called Adventism? Because whatever label we choose, we want to be taken seriously by two distinct audiences. Outsiders, which is to say non-Adventists, in which case our objective is to warn and explain. And Adventists, in which case our objective is to evangelize. As a practical matter for the purposes of this talk, I want to focus on persuading outsiders, that is, uninformed and frequently skeptical Christians. What label do we use? Option one, denomination. Even most Adventists seem to be just fine with this. Definitely not an inflammatory word. Option number two, new religious movement. Not widely applied to the Adventists, as it seems rather improbable. 169 years old equals new. But scholars such as Irving Hexham have used it. This too is not inflammatory. 
It might have someone scratching their heads, but they won't get angry. Option three, sect. From the Latin secta, meaning party or school or faction. Not flattering, but also not inflammatory. Option four, the C word, <laughs> cult. It's, it's, it's better with just a, a little bit of, you know, cult. <laughs> well, this word is almost always inflammatory, prompting either curiosity or outright hostility. It's a loaded word. It's best used with discretion and restraint. It can come across as mean-spirited and harsh and intended to cause injury, kind of a verbal weapon. And bear in mind that popular everyday use of the word cult is largely based on two perceptions, deviance and harm. Deviance as in, this group looks offbeat, unconventional, a little unsettling, maybe creepy. Harm. This group is capable of dangerous things, and I don't want to be there when they happen. So, just to help you imagine this a little better, in relation to using cult to describe Adventism, picture this conversation with me and a skeptical Christian. Me. Most people don't know this, but the Seventh-day Adventist church is a cult. Skeptic. What do you mean? Like, like the Manson family? Like Jonestown? Uh, the, the Order of the Solar Temple, Branch Davidians, Om Shin Rikyo, Nexium? Me. Well, well, no, I mean, they're not brainwashing their followers into killing people or, or committing suicide or branding their women with a hot iron. Skeptic. Oh, so like Adventists are, are what? Like the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses? Me. Well, not exactly like them. You see, those groups are kind of authoritarian, and you can tell right away that their doctrines are really kind of weird and extreme, you know, like polytheism and special underwear and forbidding blood transfusions and voting. Skeptic. Okay, but what do you mean? A bit, a, bit, a quick, quick bit, if I can spit it out, of historical background. So, none of you is probably, very few of you are probably old enough to remember these things, but 60 or so years ago, prominent evangelical authors and theologians easily applied the label cult to Seventh-day Adventism. Men like Gordon Lewis, Louis Talbot, Anthony Hokima, uh, Jan Carol van Balen, Harold Linzel, Donald Gray Barnhouse, once upon a time. But prominent evangelical authors and theologians today are often unwilling to use the cult label. And these include James Beverly, who stated in uh, his massive book on new religions that Seventh-day Adventism is in essential agreement with evangelical Christianity. Wayne House, Edmund Gruss, Ruth Tucker, who noted cultic characteristics of Adventism in her book, Another Gospel. Good for you. Uh, Norman Geisler and Ron Rhodes, who describe Adventism as aberrant in their book, When Cultists Ask. Walter Martin, <clears throat> who called Seventh-day Adventism a puzzle in Kingdom of the Cults. Look, Walter Martin is the elephant in this room. Uh, for this talk, at least. Uh, yes, I did work with him. I worked under him for nine years. I, I was with him in the United States, in Kenya, and Brazil. So, you know, it, I, we need to be careful about presuming what persons long dead would do or say if they were alive today. But, uh, and people take that liberty with Walter Martin often. It's kind of annoying. But, uh, Walter Martin was the giant speed bump for the word cult being applied to Adventism. Because, I, I almost brought my copy to wave it around. 
he said that, you know, Seventh-day Adventism was not to be regarded as a cult because he believed what those Adventists told him. And for many people, Kingdom of the Cults, this fat book that's in now, what, it's one millionth printing, um, is seen by people as the final word. Walter Martin was the guy who knew. This is the book. We can, I don't know more than Walter Martin, so the, the matter is settled, right? Now, to his credit, Walter Martin's uh, protege, Ken Samples, of Reasons to Believe, writing in the Christian Research Journal, I encourage you to read everything that Ken writes about Adventism, but he said these three things, which I quite appreciate. Quote, it would appear that traditional Adventism is at least aberrant. Quote, traditional Adventism is theologically bankrupt. And, quote, if the traditional camp continues in its departure from questions on doctrine and in promoting Ellen White as the church's infallible interpreter, then they could, one day, be fully deserving of the title cult, as some Adventists recognize. So, that by way of background. Now, in my experience, dealing with a lot of people, I'll be very interested to know what Jim says, uh, evangelicals do tend to just compare Adventism with the big two cults, the 19th century American cults, Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnesses. But you've probably noticed that Adventists appear less exclusionary and cult-like for a variety of reasons, including ecumenical outreach. They're not so openly strident in denouncing other churches. Thousands of schools, which, by the way, non-Adventists can attend. Hospitals and clinics around the world, which non-Adventists can benefit from. Not to mention international relief work, thinking here of ADRA, and seemingly greater tolerance for internal dissent than these other two groups. And in all five categories, Adventism compares favorably with the Mormon church, and even more favorably, by far, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, who are more clearly world-rejecting as an institution. So when considered next to its two closest competitors, Adventism seems less culty, you know? Have you noticed this? Now, many people, being good-hearted, in a sense, seem quite willing to give Adventists the benefit of the doubt, rather than to view them antagonistically, especially since the church can be evasive and deceptive about what it really believes and what its history really was, and quite skillful in doublespeak and gaslighting uninformed inquirers. Although, this will interest you, in a widely quoted national survey, uh, religion survey, last year, among U.S. denominations, the SDA church was viewed unfavorably by the largest number of respondents. It's the YouGov poll, look it up. So, Cults. The more formal definitions of the word cult tend to focus on two areas, behavior and beliefs. Now, behavior takes us into the province of psychologists and sociologists. We're not going there tonight. Beliefs, however, take us into the realm of theology, doctrinal orthodoxy, and heresy. How should we understand these words, orthodoxy and heresy? How many of you were here in 2015? Anyone, anyone? A few of you, yes? Of course, the Carries were here. The Grangers were here. The Takers were here. Rob Bowman was here. Dr. Robert M. Bowman Jr., uh, now president of the Institute for Religious Research. I love his book, Orthodoxy and Heresy, and he makes a lot of things wonderfully clear. This is how he defines cult, quote, a religious group originating as a heretical sect and maintaining fervent commitment to heresy. What is his definition of heresy? Quote, a teaching which opposes the essentials of the Christian faith so that true Christians must divide themselves from those who hold it. 
Now, if those are our operational definitions of cult and heresy, then mm, Seventh-day Adventism is a, as a theological system is a clear candidate. But again, to repeat, using the word cult to label Adventism can easily alienate both of the audiences we ostensibly want to persuade. So, if we're convinced that Seventh-day Adventism needs to be understood, answered, and opposed, how do we best persuade skeptical Christians of the seriousness of this problem? No, I know I'm coming along here after the tinkers have been knocking themselves out doing that very thing. But give me a chance. I propose that instead of a label that's polarizing, we use a simple description that's clarifying and that sets up a simple, memorable, biblical explanation. Something strong, succinct, sufficient, not sensationalistic, memorable, relatively easy for the average person to explain, easy to support from authoritative Adventist sources, mainly Ellen White herself. Something that anticipates objections and is therefore more difficult for Adventists to simply dismiss or deny. So let me propose a better way of labeling the problem. Seventh-day Adventism is a clever and dangerous spiritual counterfeit. So just think about that. A clever and dangerous spiritual counterfeit. That's accurate, doesn't punch the usual buttons, but stay with me. There's a companion argument that I'd like you to evaluate for me, right? This is a work in progress. So in almost every book, the New Testament warns Christians again and again about false prophets, false Christs, and false gospels. Yes? Yes. yes? yes, you've seen it, right? You don't need me to proof text that. You know it, you're persuaded. So, Seventh-day Adventism is so dangerous because it comes with all three. A false prophet, a false Jesus, and an impossible salvation. Now, I think if you share those three points with any concerned Christian, or potentially concerned Christian, you will probably have their attention. And they will, they will know in what areas they need to be wary of Seventh-day Adventism. So, a proposed approach. I've got these three points. Each of them has two or three sub-points each. I'll illustrate them with a few examples, and there, there's a bit of overlap from one point to the next. Number one, Seventh-day Adventism offers us a false prophet. By the way, a 70-year career characterized by error, deception, and confusion. While claiming divine authority, Ellen White, three sub-points, contradicted the Bible in harmful ways. Contradicted the Bible in harmful ways, not trivial ways, harmful ways. Undermining essential doctrines like the Trinity, person and work of Christ, salvation. Second, she added to the Bible in harmful ways. She fictionalized the life of Jesus. She created detailed imaginary events, invented commandments, changed the Bible's meaning again and again. And third, she made false prophecies, something that the Bible specifically makes a test for prophets. That's point number one. Point number two. Seventh-day Adventism offers us a false Jesus. What does it teach about his nature and identity? Well, confusion and mixed messages about the doctrine of the Trinity since day one. Day one. Most SDA founders were Arians who openly rejected Jesus as God. Ellen White described Jesus and Satan as being almost equals until the Father promoted Jesus in a special heavenly ceremony. She wrote that Jesus took upon himself 
recite it with me, fallen, suffering human nature, degraded and defiled by sin. And Adventism teaches that Michael the Archangel is, quote, none other than Christ. Thank you, Kaspars, for that wonderful article last week. A false Jesus, not only concerning his nature and identity, but also his work on our behalf. Ellen White claimed that Jesus had to plead with God the Father three times for permission to become the Savior. Jesus' ministry on earth was as our example to show humanity that all Ten Commandments could be kept. Jesus doubted that God the Father would even accept his sacrifice on the cross. Jesus didn't even know whether he would rise from the dead. And by the way, his atonement is incomplete, as we'll see more on this in a moment. Jesus, Seventh-day Adventism offers us a false Jesus. And third, an impossible salvation. Ellen White stated repeatedly and in various ways that our eternal salvation depends on our personal worthiness. That makes it mission impossible. That includes keeping Ellen's own invented requirements for salvation, like abstaining from drinking tea and coffee. Also, that, Jesus, that our salvation is impossible because Jesus' atonement for our sins is incomplete. An imaginary investigative judgment began in 1844, and it's still going on. None of us can know when this process will be finished or who will be saved. And guys, skeptical friends, imagine that you are my skeptical friends, Adventism doesn't exist apart from this investigative judgment. The church vanishes without the investigative judgment. Now, of course, these three major points don't exhaust what is theologically wrong with Adventism. Right? They're just the tip of the iceberg. But I believe they are potentially quite sufficient to drive home the point that Adventist teaching is deeply heretical. And yes, here it comes, cultic. Now, why use Ellen White as the launch point of this three-step explanation? Because in actual Adventist practice, the Bible is subordinate to Ellen. In her way, Ellen G. White is just as much a false prophet as Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith, even if their errors were not identical. The gravity of their sin is at least equal. Now, for my skeptical friends who might be wondering why this approach is being taken, how authoritative and influential is Adventism's false prophet? Well, according to Ellen herself, well, she repeatedly and in various ways described her own work and writings as being divinely inspired, basically infallible, and not subject to challenge. And according to Ted Wilson, the current general conference president of the SDA Church worldwide, entering his 13th year in office, Ellen is both essential and unassailable. I quote from his uh, Sabbath sermon at the October 2021 annual council meetings, quote, the spirit of prophecy is absolutely reliable and is to be believed and accepted in its entirety. Ellen White was absolutely a prophet of God and her ministry, including strong messages from the throne room of God about apocalyptic prophecy and instruction are for all time, close quote. Now, maybe you've heard about the Great Controversy Project 2.0, right? Last May, uh, Great Controversy was voted by the SDA General Conference Executive Committee as the missionary book of the year, with plans to distribute millions and millions more copies this year and next year in preparation for Jesus' return. This is Ted Wilson describing the Great Controversy, quote, it was inspired and guided by the Holy Spirit. Quote, I believe every word in this book. Quote, in fact, we're even talking about distributing up to one billion copies of this book. 
That was in 2021. So this is not a peripheral issue. There is no Adventism apart from its false prophet, Ellen G. White, as you know. So, in closing, we can sum up the core of Adventism's error in three points, and by doing so, we may be able to more easily warn and equip many Christians who might otherwise not, might not grasp the urgency of resisting Adventist proselytizing and evangelizing Adventists who are enslaved by error. Bottom line, Seventh-day Adventism is a clever and dangerous spiritual counterfeit. And it's radically wrong about three things that the Bible specifically identifies as marks of a dangerous spiritual counterfeit. Let's pray.